three. Yummy like a gummy bear. It's the internet, you're busy, let's do this for April 12th, 2024. For the next hour or so, let me help you sort through the world of gaming on Game Mess Mornings Live with me, Jeff Grubb. Today, De Destiny's 10-year plan was all leading to this, that's right, Destiny 3. And Mike Yap Barra wants us to give more money so corporations could pay developers more. But first, please join me in welcoming today's co-host at Game Mess Mornings. It's Derek Van Dyke from the Super Deluxe Games Podcast. Derek, how's it going? Hi, it's going wonderful. How about yourself on this I'm, beautiful morning? I'm doing good. I'm actually doing pretty good. It was uh, it was a little bit rainy, but I like the rain, so I agree. Beautiful morning. Uh, I was uh, took the kids to school, came back. I was getting um, Fallout Four uh, modded to hell, so Mike can play that later. That's what we're gonna do for our stream <laughs> later today. I, I like. I, I ended up paying like the premium price for uh, for uh, Nexus mods to, just so their Vortex app could, would, would work faster because I was going through one by one and installing these mods. And at the end, I installed over 100 mods. So I'm like the $5 definitely <laughs> yeah, was worth it. Ended it ended up being worth it. It ended up easily worth it. it I saved could me a not lot of imagine time. trying to burn through that many. Look, I love Nexus mods. I cannot imagine. I'm a one, one thing at a time kind of guy. So yeah, spend your five bucks. Yes. Uh, yes. I'll be the one person paying for Nexus mods. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it, so I got that ready to go. I think I got the game running. It did take the initial load did take a really long time. So I'm like, oh, boy, I hope this doesn't break. <laughs> you you never know. You put you put that much customization on a Bethesda game and you're just kind of crossing your fingers and praying uh -huh. every time. And we'll see what happens. Honestly, I mean, I, I installed all these mods. We probably won't interact with like. 90 percent of them but who, who knows we'll, we'll see what happens uh that's that's later today though for now like derek how, how have you been doing like how's uh, how's gaming treating you how's the podcast going how's everything uh you know everything's been great um of course like it's it's i'm still riding high from my return to pax east um because i spent yeah four years not doing any of the in-person stuff and just running the podcast everything remotely um so getting back into it getting back to like doing interviews doing the hustle meeting up with people meeting you in person for the first time instead of just over over text or camera um was lovely and i'm still just riding high off that also like dragon's dogma 2 came out and i'm your timeline's second biggest dragon's dogma sicko after <laughs> wow so course. i mean i've been doing great I'm I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad that you uh, that you're living in your time and it's it's finally come. Uh, you deserved it. You <laughs> earned it uh, for, for sure. Uh, yeah, I, it was great to meet you. It was great to uh, I don't know coming back from Pax East. It was really invigorating. Uh, yeah, invigorating. I don't. Everybody I, seemed to have had a lot of good energy coming back from that. So but it was helpful because you know the the vibes online were and have been bad. It's 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 been off. Yeah. Uh, you know, clearly people are in their feelings about a number of things. I still think. Uh, presidential elections get people uh, like uh, up in their head in a lot of ways, and now it's just making everything worse. And so going online or going in real life to see a bunch of people who are like, oh, everyone's just really cool. Like everyone, everyone's like yeah. human beings when they actually want to talk about this stuff in person. It's because they actually care, and they're not just some some weirdo trying to start a culture war. And so it, it was like a very helpful thing at the very right time for me. So and it was yeah. fantastic. I had a good time. It 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 turns out when you put a bunch of people together at the same time i'm trying not to get distracted that for some reason my camera keeps putting the frame around my face which it has not done ever so i don't know why that's <laughs> happening i'm very sorry for those watching um i'm just gonna try I not like, to get distracted by I that i like it it makes it makes it feel like i'm playing the Derek van dyke yeah, video game it's just like, it's like smooches yeah. go here yeah. um but <laughs> yeah no it turns out when you put people together a lot of the like awkwardness and a lot of the weird vibes melt away um it's a good reminder yes it's it's important and uh then, then i come back home i'm like oh man i love being at home and working remote and not having to deal with all that stuff constantly but it's like every you know every couple of months getting together with people rules so uh, and with that in mind i'm like I continually am now putting together summer game fest and it's like, oh yeah it's gonna be that's gonna be great as well but it's not that far away so we're already getting back into it uh, you know what? I should explain what we do here. Most weekdays, I, Jeff Grubb, will help you piece your gaming life back together. That includes breaking news and maybe even some of our own original reporting. For all these topics, I'll get the input of a bona fide expert who will make me look smart. If you are watching live on Twitch, welcome. You can always listen to the show later on podcast feeds by searching for Game Mess Mornings or find the RSS on GiantBomb.com. You can also catch the show later with chapters and timestamps on YouTube. Hello, YouTube. All right, we have a lot to get into, so let's start the morning mess with 
Destiny 2 leaker claims sequel is in development and it's codenamed Payback. This is from Moises Tavares, uh, one of the nasty boys at Kotaku. Earlier this week, Bungie unveiled most of the major features included in Destiny 2's upcoming expansion, The Final Shape, including a new enemy faction, an exotic class item item that allows players to mix and match game-changing perks, and most importantly, a chaotic new subclass called Prismatic that similarly combines previous light and dark subclasses. Goes on to talk about Destiny 2, but the bigger deal and what has currently set the Destiny 2 community alight is the second half of the user statement, where they state that Destiny 3 is in development and that the game will take Prismatic a step further, moving away from subclasses entirely. According to them, the the leaker, Destiny 3, which is reportedly codenamed Payback, has been in the works at Bungie, though they aren't sure of, of its current status at the moment. Last they heard, it was doing away with subclasses entirely, which isn't a far fetched theory considering the realities of Prismatic. Bungie likened it to an advanced subclass during its presentation, but the ramifications of multi-classing and the build craft options that Prismatic produces or introduces almost feel like they have to be the foundation for a new, deeper system in the future. Voices goes on here for, for the Destiny heads and provides a lot of details, but, you know, let's let's kind of talk the high-level stuff first, Derek. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, Destiny 2 is really finally actually at that that endpoint for the 10-year plan for Destiny, which, of course, didn't go as planned. You know, you only have a plan as long as you get to get punched in the face, right? And that definitely right, happened with Destiny right. early on, and they responded, and they made a bunch of changes, and they eventually did put out Destiny 2. But the reality is I think that they are sort of winding down this idea of uh, the original like launch ideas for Destiny that did turn into Destiny 2, and it's been years and years of updates, and now I think they finally are at a point where it's like, hmm, Destiny 3 could and should happen. Now, that doesn't mean it's happening like next year even. It's it's, it's probably a ways away still. But uh, would you be excited for a Destiny 3 and what do you think it needs to be? God, it's crazy, right? Because like Destiny 2 feels so ever present. Um yeah. and the idea of trying to follow up any of the small handful of massive like online service games that dominate the industry feels terrifying, especially in the wake of like Overwatch 2 basically destroying Overwatch. Yep. One thing that I do think helps is at least for Destiny's player base, like this is not the first time we've done this, right? We've moved from Destiny 1 to Destiny 2 already. The idea of throwing plus one onto that number is not unheard of. Um, that plus the way that destiny two has like gated off a lot of earlier, like vanilla and earlier expansion, like story content is kind of like, it it doesn't feel like it, it may not feel like I should say leaving behind the entirety of 10 years of destiny. Right. Um, it kind of just feels like moving on to the next like foundation piece. Um, so like, I'm not, I'm not a destiny sicko, but, um, I, I do think that destiny's player base is probably better primed to move on than would have been the case with something like overwatch yeah i i think it's um obviously there's conflicting factors right that where it's like hey the destiny 2 has momentum uh and and like not like that momentum of like oh it's it's so successful you can't abandon it not like that it's like people uh know what to expect from destiny 2 they they uh, they can go in there with their friends and it's a, a safe bet for how they spend their time um asking people to to like start from scratch again or however that transition would work for a destiny three is always risky but i think they are probably like looking at the spreadsheets they're looking at the calculus of you know that 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 was true for a very long time we did not want want to disrupt that momentum and the sort of network effect that people had of i'm playing the game i'm getting my friends to play that game eventually that does diminish to a point where destiny three makes a lot more sense and i think they're trying to predict it and time it out so that destiny three can come out in a world where it's like, well, obviously destiny two has run its course. Um, I think at any point from like this point forward, that's going to be like, Oh yeah, destiny two has run its course. So destiny three makes a ton of sense, but they've been hesitant about, about going to destiny three. I think cause they, for, for them, it's like, it, that is not worth it. They can get a lot more out of a game like destiny two for a lot longer than, than, you know, the way games used to work. So it's like, but I think we're at the point where they've done that multiple times now and diminishing returns have set in on these um, expansions, but who knows, maybe the final shape comes out and Destiny 2 grows in, in, into like the biggest it's ever been, something we have seen with other similar games, and then that pushes Destiny 3 even further out. But this is a team that has a Marathon also in the works. Um, oh, that's right, yeah. Right, so it's like they have to, and, and Marathon does seem like it's also kind of a ways off, but it's also taking up a lot of their time. 
uh, and I think that would come out first, and then they would do Destiny Three. So I'm like trying to figure out the timeline. We're you know we're 2024 right now. Marathon is what probably not 2025, so 2026 I guess, and then then when does the Destiny Three come out? So it's like okay, we're actually looking at several more years of Destiny Two yeah. before we get there. But I think like laying the groundwork now makes some sense. Where it's like okay, people can brace themselves and get a little bit more out of Destiny Two in the meantime. I think you have to. Um, I think it is probably better, obviously, like let this final expansion like run some of its course. I think the sooner that Bungie lays the groundwork, if, if Destiny 3 is the direction they're going for, if this is the time to move on to the next numbered entry and start people from scratch, um, they the sooner they lay that groundwork like openly and transparently to people, the better. Uh, because obviously, anytime you are going from one numbered piece of software to the next is the biggest point for people to either jump off or on the train. Um, yes. You know, and I can imagine even if you're destiny, right? Even if you're a game that defined this modern era of service games in so many ways, um, that's scary. Uh, that's intimidating to be looking down the barrel. So, yes. And I, I, I just uh, wonder if they're like uh, at a point where it's like, okay, yeah, we can see those numbers and we do know that there's a chance, there's a people who are waiting that we're never gonna either get back or they're never gonna try it because Destiny 2 is too intim intimidating at this point or there's too much uh, sunk cost in the opposite direction of like, uh, I see this game, it's massive, it's it's complex. Uh, the, there's all of these ins and outs that people and there's all these experiences that people have. And why would I jump in now when I could just dump, jump in with a Destiny 3? That That's obviously why. Yeah it makes sense. I do wonder if, because uh, it, it does still, like all that said, Derek, it still somewhat feels like a bungee reversal of their opinion on this matter, where it's like, hey, we do have Destiny 2. Destiny 2 could kind of be forever if we wanted it to. I wonder if there is any sort of pressure change from uh, Sony leadership, because uh, we know that Bungie is supposed to be running independently, but we know there's been some uh, questions about whether or not that's going to be possible with Bungie not being able to pay for itself. And so, uh, you know, Pete Parsons, the leadership over there has made a bunch of uh, cuts and things like that. And I wonder if they're like, hey, Destiny 3 is something we could like show to Sony and be like, no, we have a plan for the future. You don't need to come worry about us. Let us do this. I wonder if that, that is informing some of their decision making process here. Not that it wouldn't if they were independent, right? They'd still have to make yeah, money yeah. in that case. So I, but I but like, there's no way it's not when it's sony right like yeah. especially with we know sony has kind of like quietly not not even quietly right like because we've all heard about the struggles they've had to try to pivot into like a very service game dominated like direction and how that hasn't mostly worked out for them and destiny is this like one very stable piece that both clearly defined that direction in terms of where they wanted to go and also is the only like one of the rare examples um, of a game actually holding on because games don't last service games don't last as long as destiny has um, Usually no. it's it's really very much a rarity and the idea of taking it much longer um I, I totally understand the idea of like you know hey man like world of warcraft and final fantasy 14 have made it way longer than this so you know who's to say that destiny 2 couldn't eventually hit those numbers but like man the further into the outliers you're aiming that's that's playing right. with fire. So uh, there is a there is a, a service game la that has lasted much longer than uh, Final Fantasy XIV uh, or uh, or World of Warcraft. And actually, I think it is longer than World of Warcraft, and it's called Roblox 2006. I think about <laughs> it all the time. <laughs> oh, it's so weird. <laughs> Runescape sickos. Also, Let's Runescape go. sickos. Yes, honestly, all those games from that time are still going in one way or another. Um, God, and then Final Fantasy XI also has lasted longer. Sure, yes, that's yeah. just that's just linear time though. Uh, I, hey, I'll I will check in on Destiny Three when it comes out. I'm probably not yeah. going to play Destiny Two again. Uh, I've just accepted that. I mean. I don't know if my like group of friends suddenly is playing Destiny 2 all the time and I have a lot more free time. That could happen, I suppose. But I, I just know myself. I'm like, once Destiny 3 is here, it gives, offers that fresh start, that's when I'll check back in on this series. And I think they're they're counting on that among a, a large audience to finally come back to that, that franchise with the third one. Yeah. 
All right, let's move along here. Pac Man. While you oh, while ahead, you please. you while you say this, I'm gonna briefly turn my camera around and kill camera and try to kill camera square. Did I know you? chat I know chat is in love with camera square right now, but it is so camera distracting my for favorite me. character on Giant Bomb. <laughs> it's gonna get its own wiki entry. All right. I'll, I'll read this. You go and work on that. Yeah, no. yeah absolutely. Uh the second story here, Pac-Man Mega Tunnel Battle Chomp Champs, which is just poetry of a name has been dated for console and PC. This is from Jordan Midler at VGC. It's an updated version of the 64 player battle royale game, Pac-Man Mega Tunnel Battle, which launched in 2020 for Stadia, but closed down last year alongside Google's game streaming service. The online only game will be available on May 9th for PS5, PS4, Xbox Series X and S, Xbox One, Nintendo Switch and Steam. Uh, it, here's a quote here from the game's description. Eat your way through multiple interconnected mazes using power pellets and various power items to chomp the ghost and other packs. Uh, be the last pack standing at the end of the each 64 player match to be the chomp champ reads the game's description. All right. Um, I'm going to try to remember the name of this game. I just read it. Derek. <laughs> it's a lot of words. Pac-Man. Man, Mega Tunnel Battle Chomp Mega Champs. Tu yeah, Mega Tunnel Battle Derby. <laughs> no, ba okay, yeah, Battle. Okay, Mega Tunnel Battle Chomp Champs. 64. Wow. Turbo yeah. Edition. <laughs> uh, that hell of a name. I did play this on Stadia when it was out on there. I guess this is an updated version of that. It's okay. It's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm hoping it could do a lot better now that it's on other platforms, but, um, I don't know. It doesn't have that like battle royale feel of even like a uh, F zero ninety nine or even a Super Mario Brothers thirty five. Yeah, um, like those ones. It's like, oh yeah, it felt like you're all competing. This is like you're in your own maze, and then you go over the next maze. I mean, you do eat other Pac Man, but it's not like crazy chaos or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. But I I like Pac Man a lot. I'm glad they're doing more stuff with this. Um, and a vestige of Stadia lives on here. Any chance you check out a, a Pac Man battle royale game? Um, man, I don't know. So I, I F099 is the first time I got into one of these like, hey, we took an old game and we let an absurd number of people play it simultaneously. Yeah. Um, and it was way more engaging than I thought it would oh, be. That's a great game. And it does make me wish I hadn't missed like Tetris 99, Mario 35, you know, that I'd had an opportunity to play, um, you know, the pa Pac-Man Mega Tunnel Battle, um, <laughs> not not Chomp Champ 64 no. Turbo Edition. Um, I would, I would check it out. Right. I mean, I know a couple of sickos for these type of games. We took an old pixel game and, and let a hundred people play it at once. None of them care about the Pac-Man one. Um, but it feels sacrilegious not to try, right? It's, sure. it's Pac-Man, you know, I'm, I'm, I also like, uh, Whenever they do something new with Pac-Man, they put the new spin on it. Usually, they have a a, a good look, and I hope that this one is uh, updated with a lot of uh, great, like, uh, just visual flair because they're they're yeah. good at that with these Pac-Man games. Um, and the the one for Stadia again was just okay uh, uh, for those factors. It didn't like stack up to Championship Edition, which I think is a classic game at this point. Um, but I'm at the same time, I'm also just like, hey, you know, uh, Bandai Namco always out there doing more stuff with pac-man at all times uh they're not letting that franchise uh wilt in any way and th i appreciate that more than anything else yeah at least um, they're keeping him busy you know they're unlike keep, they're you giving know, the man work which like, is look i love you capcom but like Mega Man, what's up right exactly, like yeah i think i think when you're when you're that much of a, of a grandpa of the industry like you should be able to get regular work even if it's just charity work right right yeah and look in your own game uh like yeah it's awesome that like uh, Mega Man was so busy in smash brothers and all that stuff but like let's get him his own game again Again. I mean, yeah. obviously, Mega Man 11 came out. God, that was probably a long time ago. That was way now. too many years ago, but it's not as recent uh, as you think. It's not as recent as I think. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, Pac Man, Pac Man is staying busy. Old Man still gets out of the house, go does a thing. I'm happy. <laughs> yes. That's, that's all it is. Maybe it's not for me, but it makes me happy to know what's happening. All right. Um, Let's see here. Moving along. Fallout 4 is finally getting new content and improvements on PS5, Xbox, and PC. This is from George Yang at GameSpot. Bethesda has re revealed a bunch of new information regarding Fallout 4 and its long-awaited update for PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X and S. It was originally announced back in 2022, but it was delayed to this year. The update is free and will be released on April 25th. The update will include native versions of, for both of the newest consoles, as well as the choice of, to pick between uh, performance and quality modes. 
Specifics for these weren't shared, but Bethesda did note you can experience up to 60 frames per second and increased resolutions. I oh, always where it's like up to, <laughs> yeah, right? But my understanding is that actually they can have a solid 60 frames per second mode. This is still. a nine-year-old game. Exactly. Hopefully it can hit 60 frames per second. But Right. I'm like, oh my God, up to 60 frames per second. But no, apparently it's fine. Uh, you better run at that, though. You're, you're correct. Uh, those still playing on PS4 and Xbox One will receive a free update and uh, with stability improvements and quest fixes, the PC version will also add widescreen and ultra widescreen support along with fixes to the creation kit and update quest updates uh, the game is already on steam microsoft store and gog but will also now be available to purchase on epic game store it will also become steam deck verified which i'm always happy to hear about um yeah th this this is cool i mean we get why they do this right though i mean the, the, the update yeah. was always planned sure it took a long time but the timing of it isn't a coincidence that it's out now when the show is out they they know they've seen the numbers a bunch of times for these shows that do pop off in a big way based on video games do lead people back to the games and that means fallout 4 is like is going to be the one that is the most likely to benefit from that so having this yeah, update ready yeah. to go is great uh, i bet they wish they had a newer fallout not 76 yes. ready yes. to go they'd probably really benefit in that case but four is not like some game that people are gonna go back to be like oh I, I'm, I'm like this is i can't play this this is so old it's part of that that generation of games where it's like yeah this could kind of come out today obviously we need some updates here and there but that's kind of what, what this that's is what they're doing. So, exactly and it's clear yeah, they've been confident about this fallout show for a while right yes. so like it makes sense that they were like okay let's start planning out if the show's going to come out and it's going to potentially draw people back into the franchise you know, yeah, get, get a little get a little story content update to a nine year old game. Let's throw, you know, some some creation club content in there and, and yep. give it a little spit polish shine. Um, you know, granted, half my timeline seems to be going back to New Vegas, not four. Um, but I mean, that's just that's the first off, like, you know queer people love new vegas i don't know how to explain that, that. I've heard so that and that's before, yes. and that's 80 percent of my community so <laughs> yeah, right. um you know but uh yeah i mean of course like i think most normal people are going to look at four because they're going to see 76 as sort of a weird semi-online service game yes. and read some old headlines about it and just go oh let me just go back to the last numbered one um yeah so I, I, I think people, i mean they'll, they'll look you're exactly right i think the, the, the 76 will get some shine there for sure but people be like no i mean i mean the game i could play single player i want the story yeah and that will yeah. lead them to four absolutely but i mean I, new vegas is also going to pop off in a big way because of this i i expect more people to be playing new vegas in the next couple of weeks than have played it in the last year or so yeah um and that that'll be fantastic they will sell three more copies of new vegas yes <laughs> hey, everyone already owns that right it's, yeah, it's like right. been in every steam sale like people <laughs> bought that five times over now um boy do they actually find a way to get a new uh, fallout game out relatively quickly from now because i don't see how they can they are so far away from doing that at bethesda game studios proper, that is right? just not the way that their workflow has been man yeah. i mean look at how long starfield took to come out um yep. and look at the reception to starfield being as mixed as it was right even amongst bethesda sickos um elder scrolls is way off on the horizons mm -hmm. um you know and fallouts had multiple releases in the time since the last Elder Scrolls. So just like, could they f move things around and fast track it? Sure. I don't see a new like Fallout 5 until after Elder Scrolls. I think they are really, they've got to be hands on deck trying to get Elder Scrolls out the door, you know? Yeah. I, so, okay. Let's say you are in charge of Microsoft then and uh, you're looking over at Bethesda and you're looking at um, the Softworks in the studio, game studio. And they're like, yeah, that's right. We just did Starfield and we are still working on updates that we want to get that into a better place. So that's going to keep us busy. And then we've already promised Elder Scrolls six after that. So we have to work on that next. So in reality, we are looking into the 2030s before we can make the next real Fallout game. But yeah. you're like, well, hey, I would like a new Fallout game, a new real Fallout game before that. What is the solution? Like, what do you think it's? Do you think it's taking it to back to Obsidian? I think they're. I mean, they're right there, but they're I mean, also very busy. Do you make yeah, a new I was gonna team? Say they're very busy. I think. Look, here's the deal, right? And I've I've said this for a little bit. Um, but Microsoft, one of the smartest things Microsoft can leverage, is the fact that they don't probably don't particularly give that much of a shit about keeping 
specific franchises, specifically with the individual development teams and old publishing houses that used to make them, right? There is nothing stopping Microsoft from getting some other external contractor to get working on Fallout because Bethesda's too busy, right? It's the same thing that theoretically is a huge benefit for Blizzard, right? That yeah. like you can get somebody to make you a StarCraft spinoff or, or a Diablo spinoff because Microsoft doesn't need it to be a Blizzard team. Now, Microsoft has kind of been struggling for a while at getting games to actually come out the door. So, right. I mean, I don't know that if, if, if Microsoft goes, okay, today we are, we are hiring and a, a contracting out an external studio to get working on a fallout game. We're not going to call it fallout five. It'll be fallout subtitle, whatever. Um, fucking fallout Jacksonville. And, <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, it's still, man, that game is still six to eight years away. The way that game development works these days, you know, yep. even in the best of situations. Yep. Yeah, exactly right. Which is why I think they can't wait for, you know, things to just play out with uh, Bethesda Game Studios, because even in the best case scenario, we are looking at the 20, like probably 2030 at the earliest for a Fallout game. And that is one not made by Bethesda Game Studios or not directly made by them. So, right. I, I, they probably do come up with some solution here. Um, someone in the chat. Uh, the, yeah, the show got a second season, apparently. Uh, so yeah, uh, already greenlit. Already so. greenlit. I didn't I did not see that. So, I, I mean, fallout is in going to be in its bag right now that like it's going to be very popular it's going to be very hot for this moment and that will permanently raise the profile of fallout going forward um so yeah they're gonna they're gonna want to shake something loose there uh I, like i've said i've said this before i know there was just a conversation uh between I mean, between my name and the way there was conversation of the idea that obsidian could make a follow-up to fallout new vegas like that yeah. conversation was something they have had but of course i'd be they into that i'd the be same so roof. into that yes. you know but yeah uh, i don't know it really today like it feels like the best option that a lot of these giant publishers have is you know look at like um stuff like the rogue prince of persia just being announced um is it's like more and more maybe you're if you really want to in any reasonable length of time, capitalize on the popularity of something, you've kind of got to aim double A and let a small external yeah. studio make a smaller title with your property, something that's a spinoff, something that's not like a traditional numbered entry. Um, and I have no idea what that looks like for Fallout, but like if you want a game out in the next couple years that's not already deep in development, that's almost your only option. And and, and then, I mean, but I, I wonder if they look at it and it's like, but the audience we would be attracting toward the game from the television show are going to be like, I know what the most modern games look like. This should look like that. And if it doesn't quite match their, uh, their view of like, hey, this doesn't look like those Last of Us games. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Which, which that's of, a course, good point. of course, but that's the game is not going to look like that. But they, but still, I, I think people are going to be like, hey, if it looks double, if it looks uh, less expensive, less premium, yeah. Then it's this is not the real game. That's that's what I'm, not what I'm talking about. I want the real game. Where's that at? Um, yeah. So I wonder if it doesn't matter how stylized it is. It doesn't yeah. matter how good of the art direction is. If it doesn't look like big, pretty realistic, then a lot of the more like casual audiences um, who you know play some games and and come to a game because they saw it in a TV show first are yeah. I mean their expectations are just completely different from a sicko like me. Yep. So. Uh, but hey, I would like a smaller one. Someone said Fallout Tactics Two. Crazy Bob and Chat said that. That yeah, yeah. Let's get let's mm, get one of those. That'd speaking be great. my language, yes, make every game a tactics game. Let's yeah, go. Yeah. We want tiles <laughs> and everything. Absolutely. Yes. And then uh, then just let the characters date. And I think you got a game right there. You yeah, got a game. yeah. That's correct. That's every mechanic a game needs. Uh, let's stick with Bethesda. Uh, Todd Howard keeps saying no to an Elder Scrolls TV show. This is from Jordan Midler at, at VGC. Speaking to IGN on the red carpet at the premiere of Amazon's Fallout TV series in Los Angeles, Howard addressed the possibility of a show based on Bethesda Game Studios' other big franchise. Everybody asks like about El Elder Scrolls, and I keep saying no. Howard said, "You never know if someone's going to, if some, someone's going to click. I think this uh, this really came out of we think things are aligning to do a high quality job. I wasn't forced. And I think he's talking about uh, Fallout there. Uh, yeah. I can't predict the future, but this has been one of the most enjoyable projects I've ever done, and we're just over the moon. Everybody in the studio was seeing it this way." Uh, Amazon's Fallout live action series premiered this week. Variety recently reported the filming for the second season will see production move to California as part of a tax incentive. Where was the first one filmed? Vancouver, probably? I'm almost certain. Probably. Uh, that's, probably, that's, right? th that tracks. Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, I know Shogun was filmed in Vancouver. That's uh, yeah. where a lot of those shows happen. Um, people chatter saying yes. 
Uh, yeah, so, I mean, the, the show's uh, clearly in, in a, doing very well, it seems like. I haven't watched it yet, uh, but... Um, me but neither, the bu- but... The, bu- the buzz is starting to get to me. Uh, how about you, Derek? I know. Are you, uh, I, are you feeling it? I like, need, to, I need it to watch it. The main problem is is it's one of those shows, like, my wife really badly wants to watch it, um, so we need to watch it together. I'm not allowed to watch it without sure. her. But we have, like, three other shows that are on, like, we're currently watching through, so it's like something, a spot has to get freed up in order for Fallout to to, to get in there. Um, and it's like, I think the reason that Fallout worked and Fallout attracted so many people, aside from just being apparently a good show, right, um, is it is something kind of unique that a lot of people who don't play games and aren't familiar with Fallout haven't seen anything with Fallout's kind of aesthetic and vibe. This weird mix of like apocalyptic and Wild West and old timey um you know to its specific era and like the ghouls the german shepherd the the weird like you know flight suits the vaults it's it's such a unique aesthetic that people saw those trailers and were like this looks weird this looks a little zany this looks a little interesting like i gotta know that plus good buzz of course this show was gonna blow up um I don't know if this is has anything to do with why Todd Howard's saying no, because uh, I can't be inside that man's head. I don't think those same factors exist necessarily for Elder Scrolls, right? Yeah. Elder Scrolls on its face looks like the most generic fantasy you could possibly put right. to it's, anything. To its benefit in the video game space, where it's like people want to have the thing they think of when they think of fantasy in a game and play around with it in a playground, and the game offers that. I think in a TV show, you kind of have to, well, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't think, know. I think, I think it could work. I, think, I don't know. Yeah. It, I think it absolutely could, but I don't think it has quite the immediate punchiness of something like fallout that comes with that built in kind of satirical edginess. If you do it right, that has that kind of unique aesthetic, like elder scrolls, isn't funny. Um, it's not, well, it's not intentionally, funny. not intentionally um, funny. No, it is accidentally one of the funniest Constantly, games yes. ever made. Um, but like, also, I don't think people go to Skyrim because they're in love with killing their 10,000th Draugr, right? Like right. it's because of the weird, like sense of freedom and the ways that that game works as a sandbox. Um, and that's the stuff that doesn't translate to a film or to a series. It's going to be story lore aesthetic and elder scrolls just doesn't have as much going for it in that front at least not on a surface level i'm sure there are elder scrolls lore sickos who are here to tell me about how interesting all this stuff is if you just read this book um but like as somebody who just played skyrim and that's it like i just don't know how you could put a trailer out for an elder scrolls thing and not have everyone go oh it looks like another fantasy thing yeah i mean uh, and I think the lore can be fascinating, but the lore of anything can be fascinating. Yeah, um, yeah. But like, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, that new movie, the way the reason it like worked and it, whether or not it succeeded or not, I'm not even paying attention to that, but the, it did work for me. And the reason it worked is because it like captured the energy of a bunch of people sitting around a table trying to entertain one another and have a fun adventure and kind of having these very strong characters that are always going to do their stupid thing. And, and that vibe, they captured that. And it's like, okay, yeah, that's them capturing the feeling of a tabletop RPG. Um, and that's how they made Dungeons and Dragons work in 2023. Um, Elder Scrolls, how do you how do you capture the things that bring the pe- people to Elder Scrolls? And you're right. It's not easy because that sense of openness is there and it's um, exploration and stumbling acro- across things. And I don't know if that's great for a narrative scripted television show or or film. But yeah, again, I, hey, I'm, I'd be happy to be proven wrong. I really like uh, Elder Scrolls. I even have a, sometimes uh, have fun reading those little lore books and stuff like yeah. that. But, I mean, uh, I say we'll this see. like The Witcher didn't blow up on Netflix, right? So like. But but that's not something that was as much of a given. Like it had to come out and people be like, "Oh, this was actually really good." Yeah. Um, and it did. And it, and it like and the way it blew up was just like, okay, people are hungry for fantasy. Um, excuse me, I'm gonna sneeze. Um, I will nope, tell you, a go. lot of it was thirst over Henry Cavill, right? Yeah, like, I think, yes, exactly. That's, and, that's 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 you gotta get you gotta get somebody who gets the the theys and the ladies and the gays really sweaty under the collar if you want an Elder Scrolls thing to to work. And it's just again, it's a different vibe. Like The Witcher is inherently a little bit like sweatier and leatherier of a franchise than yes. Elder Scrolls is. So, and, and I think uh, you know, The Witcher is a character is a very strong central idea. 
of this character that's that's hated and just does his job and has all these uh, abilities you could build a story around that pretty easily yeah I that's just, a good point i, I mean God, dragonborn I, but it's not the same it actually isn't the same it's not quite to the level of the witcher yeah um all right we're gonna take a quick break when we get back a lot more headlines there's some new games there's uh, executives saying dumb stuff uh, all your favorites right after this all right we are back and I believe we are, yes, here, Kingdom Come Deliverance developer Warhorse Studios is to reveal a new game next week. Once again, this is from Jordan Midler at VGC. Shout outs to Jordan. Uh, Kingdom, Kingdom Come Deliverance developer Warhorse Studios will review a new game next week in a post on Twitter. The developer teased that it will show off a new game on April 18th. Uh, the teaser image shows kind of like a man on a horse. This is obviously the studio of Kingdom that did, did, that did Kingdom Come Deliverance, which is kind of a... A more historically grounded, um, uh, uh, kind like of aesthetically, it's a lot more grounded, right? Right. Like, yeah. Correct. Um, yes. In um, a lot of ways, I'd say it's also kind of jankier, right? Yes. Like, which is kind of sometimes the vibe that, that you're going for. Um, yeah, that that you're, yeah. sort of Euro jank, uh, uh, the open world game that I that, Euro jank is a great term. <laughs> yes, I, I my old editor would say that all the time. I'm like, yeah, and I'm like, that's my jam. Give me more Euro jank. Um, and you know that, that Kingdom, Kingdom Come Deliverance did very well. It seemed like so. I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if this is just straight up Kingdom Come Deliverance two, like a big full sequel. Um, I, there I, could be Warhorse hasn't done anything like Kingdom Come Deliverance was like the late twenty tens, right? That's like yeah, set 2017, so. 2018. and I don't. I think that's been like the only thing they've. I don't think, I, they I think put they, anything they just out kept working since. on that game, right? They just yeah. kept doing updates to it. So, uh, and you know, there is in this image again. It's a uh, what looks like medieval knight kind of person, not wearing armor or anything, but you know, wearing like fancy leather gloves and uh, and an overcoat, sitting on a horse with um, kind of reins that do look like they're also from that time. Uh, that this you know could always be a bait and switch, but I think that the best bet for them probably is Kingdom Come Deliverance too, especially if they can uh, do something that feels like it's a bit much bigger and and building on those ideas and capable of feeling like more modern even. Um, I was not someone who loved Kingdom Come Deliverance. I, like I played that game for a few hours, and it felt kind of broy to me in a way that I was like, "Ugh." Uh, yeah, I, I always described I, it as like Entourage in, in the medieval times. And, yeah, and it's like, it's not for not me. For. And like you know, a couple people on the team, right? But like, yeah, um, I gotta, I gotta see. Here's the thing, right? Here's ultimately all that matters is what what is this game? Yep, right. I do think the team has some talent. They clearly were able to to strike maybe more silver than gold with with Kingdom Come Deliverance. Like it hit big, but it didn't hit like massive big. Um, but what are they making? What's the angle that they're going for? What sort of like narrative content is going to be in it? What is their what's the pitch? Yeah. Um, and it's hard when you've got a studio who has one game to their name. Um, to try and draw from like a bunch of past works, like it, this could be anything. Um, yep. And to that to that extent, it's almost a little exciting to see what a a studio with without that like long library of work to see what they could be doing. Um, even if it's not a studio I'm particularly attached to, like you do always want to see what these these more independent studios might be up to. Yeah, and and I, like for me, it's always like we uh, talk doom and gloom about the future of AAA development and their ability to produce the kinds of games we want. And my original excitement before like the Kingdom Come Deliverance team kind of soured that with a lot of their behavior uh, was that, hey, we this is a small team making one of those these big open world games uh, where it feels like you can maybe mod this and turn it into whatever you want. And it, that that's really exciting that we're starting to get these now. Um, we haven't had a ton more of those since then, uh, yeah. but I, I hope we're at a point where it's like, you know, uh, other studios can start looking at this and be like, yeah, we could do that too and fill in those gaps because uh, AAA development is going to continue being like, we're afraid to try anything new. So it's going to be, be down to smaller studios. And I hope those smaller studios are feeling confident about that. And this seems to suggest that at the very least. Yeah. Um, X Blizzard chief thinks it should be possible to tip game developers. This is from Jonas Mackey at Game Reactor. Mikey Barra uh, spent 20 years working at Microsoft, mostly on the Xbox team, but in 2019, he packed his bags and headed to Blizzard. There, he eventually became the veteran developer's top executive before leaving shortly after Microsoft took over the studio late last year. 
Recently, he has been very active on social media, mainly Twitter, where he often writes unexpectedly frankly about problems in the industry as well as his own thoughts and opinions. Now he has been at it again and delivers a rather unexpected proposal. Ibarra thinks it should be possible to tip developers who have offered something really special with a complete gaming experience where it never felt like the studio was trying to hustle you for money all the time. In these cases, a full price tag is simply not enough, he says. And when, and when the end credits roll, it should be possible to chip in another $10 or $20 because it was worth more than my initial $70 and they didn't try to nickel and dime me every second. Hibara adds that he knows that many people don't like the concept of tipping, but say, says that there would be no pressure to tip because it's done anonymously in your home. And perhaps such a system would encourage developers to actually deliver something more finished and complete without microtransactions, season passes, and the like, as doing so could suddenly could suddenly lead to higher revenues. So here's here's the thing. Uh, yikes, yikes and Barra strikes again, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> it's... On, on a totally surface level, if I'm not thinking deeply about this, in theory, there's nothing that harmful about sure. the idea of being like, yeah, I really like this game and I want to show my appreciation to the people who made it. Um, the, the complication comes in, um, I think there's two angles that immediately hit me. The first is that this is probably going to result in primarily more money going to the same games that are already huge and soak up all the money in the industry. Right. Right. We've seen and reports to the, not to the developers, but the people that own the studios. Yes. Right. Cause that's, yeah. that's part two, right. Is like, Hey guys, you do already know that when you tip through the DoorDash app, that like 80% of that goes to DoorDash and not the driver. And it's going to be the same problem here. When you tip through steam or PlayStation or whatever, like more of that's going to go to the publisher and their shareholders then is going to go to like, it's not like you're putting $10 broken up between the, like how many people on a team, um, right. you exactly. know? Yeah. And, and I mean, and then on top of that, it's like, um, they have so like he talks about these season passes and all these other ways they have for, for, for getting money. It's like, so you, you have been taking extra money from us for a very long time. Where the hell did that money go? We, we, yeah. we, we yeah. are spending more money on these games. Where did that money go? Did that not go to the developers to give them more money? And the answer is, of course, it didn't. Like some of it did yeah. to give raises slowly over time. But if there was profits, if there was actually like substantial profits, that did not go to the to the developers. It goes to the studio heads, executives, bonuses, uh, dividends, yeah. uh, buybacks uh, for stock for, for shareholders. It goes towards that stuff. Um and so why the hell is it our goddamn responsibility to pay these people for making the game? We already paid for the game. That's the money. We yeah. gave you the money. Pay yeah. them. What are you I'm, talking about? Bitch, I'm broke. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. I am I am but, a poor kid from Kentucky. I do not have tipping California people money. You know what that, I mean? Like that's and that's exactly the, the point. Is that uh they are making it feel Mikey Barham wants to feel like it's our responsibility. Look, we like it's not their responsibility when I can't pay rent or my mortgage or I have any of these issues where it's like I don't have enough money for something. And it's never like, hey, lower the prices of your games so that I can afford to like still partake in this hobby. Like, yeah. well, no, we, we got they got to go up in price because that's, you know, we, we're it's a premium product. It's got to go like they don't ever care about that. But when they need to pay developers for making the games. Well, come on, chip in a little bit. Like, let's see if we can right. help out. What are you talking And the talking people who about? should chip in are us. Again, like, it's exactly like you said. The fact that these these increased prices on games and these season passes and these these uh, battle passes and all these sorts of, of ways to increase monetization, uh, when a game does super well, that money does not... It's not like the devs get royalties. It's not like no. suddenly every programmer who worked on that game is swimming in a pile of gold. Um, most of that's going to executives and most of that's going to stock buybacks, like you said. So um, there's money for the developers. It just has to come out of the hands of the people at the top who don't do shit to make these games. Um, you know, um, and yeah, like I'm not I'm not the person to squeeze blood from, um, you know, from that stone, which is not to say that, like, again, I wouldn't like I feel I feel a little different when it comes to indies. Right. Like sure. if a three person team makes a game um, and it just it changes my life. Right. Which happens surprisingly often with indie titles. Um, you know, 
good news is a lot of these folks have like Patreons and Kickstarter or just a Ko-Fi page. Yeah, Ko-Fi, yeah. Right? Where you could just be like, here you go. So like for the indies, you've already got that option. And that's where you, as somebody who wants to throw five bucks at somebody, are going to make a difference. Um, given I, but, ten but, uh, bucks. Our rules in chat, like it's like the bigger difference is buy that game as a gift for a friend. Tell yeah. somebody about the game. Honestly, yeah. the word of mouth at like marketing almost is worth more than just giving them an extra $5. It absolutely is. Because that is where they thrive and, and survive on, with, with these games. So, again, so it, much of our doing economy of revolves around marketing. And yeah. you talking about something is free marketing. That has monetary value. Like, yep. um, But yeah, it's just like me giving 10 bucks to like look i i like i just brought up dragon's dogma 2 right if i gave 10 bucks to capcom for dragon's dogma 2 even if all 10 of those dollars went to the team and they wouldn't um how many hundreds of people worked on dragon's dogma yeah. 2 right it's nothing right. It, it breaks down does, to nothing doesn't make any sense um yeah. so the only the only games that are going to consistently get those kind of things will be your grand theft autos your fortnites your destinies the games that already make all the money anyway um so it just doesn't do anything for like 95 percent of games out there um and, you know and if you really want to tip some of these developers you probably can't find their ko-fi yeah. on their twitter <laughs> yeah. handle or something tip them directly uh, God, if there was a tip jar at the end of a major video game, I would lose my mind. <laughs> I would lose it. I would just lose it. <laughs> what are we doing here? That's I think crazy. I think I would get a cerebral hemorrhage from how hard my eyes rolled uh-huh. involuntarily. Uh, yeah. Uh, all right, um, Mike. But you just gotta. Sh- you know what? Shut the fuck up, Friday. <laughs> Shut the fuck Celebrate up. it. <laughs> Uh, Nintendo Switch Online is adding three new games. This is from Nintendo Everything. Uh, three new games just dropped on Nintendo Switch Online. Uh, Wrecking Crew 98, Amazing Hebereki, and Super R-Type. And I like Super R-Type. This Amazing Love Hebereki looks like, uh, Mike mentioned it looks like Power Stone. Yeah, I've never like, heard of this one. Yeah. Um, but it's like Super Nintendo Graphics Power Stone. I'm like, ooh, that sounds fascinating. So maybe yeah, we'll you have my attention. Like, yeah, exactly. This looks adorable. And then uh, Wrecking Crew 98 is one that, another one that both both Amazing Hebereki and Wrecking Crew 98 never came out here. They were Japan only. Yeah. Uh, so I, I do like when they do that. That's pretty neat. Um, all this right. is R-Type season. <laughs> yes. Uh, and yes, exactly. I'll, I'll always make time for R-Type in my life. Uh, I, you know, I, I guess overall, though, how are you feeling about Nintendo Switch Online? Um, you know, I mean, they need to add another console to it already, right? Like, yeah. um, I, I, well, okay, I say that. I do like that Nintendo has is having to dig deeper into the libraries and pull some of these Japan only yeah, games. You know, um, I'm very happy for that versus like if GameCube games were on there right now, it just means we'd see the same big GameCube games I've played a dozen times already. Um, but like this is fun, but like you got to add you got to add another console on there sooner or later. And I got an idea in my head. It's fine. It's if it's fine. not the, if it's not the GameCube, which I think is still like Put questionable. Super Castlevania Four on there, guys. What's going yeah, on? Like that, yeah, Konami and all those companies are like <laughs> exactly. Like, yeah, we'll just sell those. Um, yeah, if it's not GameCube, uh, what do you think they could do? Because uh, I'm like, I, I'd love to. See, I would love to see Sega Saturn on there, but I wonder if that's v- v- feasible. <laughs> Sega Saturn didn't have games. What are you talking about? Well, yeah, uh, that makes it easier, right? <laughs> then they just put the five games on there and they're done. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. It goes in a new tier with just the Sega Saturn and Virtual Boy. And Turbo Graphics isn't on there, right? It's not. It's uh, funny that it's not because that was part of the Wii Virtual Console way back was, in the day. It was like a huge, like, like leg, a huge crunch yeah. for the Virtual Console. Put the, put like, the PC Engine on there, you know? I mean, yeah. it, I. But if you want to get real wild, put like Atari and shit on there. Like that'd be neat. You know, it, it can't cost you much to do that. And that, that like new Atari uh, like leadership is like pretty down to clown. So yeah, yeah, absolutely they huh, are. That'd be uh, neat. They seem like a good crew. Um, yeah, yeah. I just you know I, I I think really they need to to look backwards and and spread out. Um, cause obviously like, it's probably going to be a while before we see GameCube stuff ever get added to that subscription I service. Mean, they're, they're just going to, uh, f- for uh, the next 10 years still, I think they're going to just sell us GameCube games as remasters. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Like, it's like no, it's recent it. enough and modern enough that it's something where they can just delve into it for remasters. Right. Like and you they, said, and they did that for super Nintendo and, and in 64 for a very long time and only recently got to the point where like, yeah, we can just put these into a bundled subscription and that yeah. took a very long time. Um, all right, let's uh, look at these last couple of stories here. Content warning sells 700,000 700, copies after going paid. Uh, this is from Alex Hopley at Game Reactor. 
Content warning, the co-op horror game where you have to film entertaining videos while risking your life for internet fame immediately attracted a lot of attention when it launched, not only because it came out of nowhere, but also because it was free for the first 24 hours. This led to over 600 mil or 6 million people, not 600 million, 6 million people uh, hurrying to grab the game before they had to pay for it. And even after the game slapped on a price tag, it has still managed to sell an impressive amount of copies. Speaking with PC Gamer, Landfall CEO Wilhelm Nyland spoke about how he never expected such a response. It felt likely that Content Warning would be bigger than any of our uh, similar small projects, but we definitely didn't expect it to happen so quickly. It was definitely a lot of excitement and a lot of confusion about how it blew up as quickly as it did. Um, so yes, the game sold 100,000 copies in its first day, and at uh, the end of its first week, it had sold 700,000 copies, which is... Huge for any, any any game that's around this size, uh, yeah, without yeah. a doubt. Seems like an idea they put together pretty quickly, and they just put it out there. It's a solid game. I really, yeah. really enjoy it. Couldn't um, be happier. It's a funny concept. It's obviously yeah. kind of picking up on the same, like, DNA that, like, you know, Phasmophobia and then, like, uh, Lethal Company put down. Um, and it shows that there's a lot of, obviously, like, there's this huge segment of the market Um that that loves these sort of like easy viral like high concept but simple multiplayer games that are more about being funny than being like mechanically super tight right um and i'm super happy for that and also again like back to the tip jar like the, buy indie games right yeah, like that's how you make them. a difference in this industry it's great to see this little game sell as many copies uh because it's a small team and that money goes a lot further for a small team so, um, yeah, this this strategy of going free for the first day and then having a price after that, it, it just clearly worked. Right. And I think yeah. for, for me, I, I look, I was watching um, uh, Nova the other day, which is that PB, PBS science show about the Forbidden City and how they were like the emperor wanted 100,000 of the of logs from these trees that grew like on the other side of the country. And so they had to like put them on these sleds on the ice and and uh part of that or it, it was like brick stone something like that. they had to put some stuff on these sleds on on ice and the the process of getting it started was very difficult it required a lot of energy but once it started going it was it only took one person to continue pulling it down the ice yeah. so it's like getting started getting over that initial hump is the hardest thing or like what charlie munger says about like who's saving money and like becoming rich it's like that first hundred thousand is the real bitch after that it like compounding interest just makes it work this yes. feels like compounding interest right mm -hmm. once you've got six million people getting the game for free sure you had to give it away there's gonna be costs incurred there but you are immediately over the hump there in terms of getting people the, the compounding interest of people's interest and now that is just flooding in with people like being well i can't miss out my friends are playing so i'm gonna pay money i i mean i'm just like really impressed that this strategy hadn't been tried before really as far as i can remember not in like this exact way not with any no. game like this and it clearly worked uh, also a little bit lightning in the bottle not every game can do this right sure sure well and like of course the question is going to be like can can content warning like keep this momentum up is what i think a lot of people would would immediately ask right because for example like phasmophobia blew up back in the day lethal company blew up and like they had that real like li you know lightning in a bottle kind of moment um, that this is kind of like feels like the next version of that. Um, but you don't see anywhere near the same kind of talk about lethal company now as there was, right. You know, um, even, even six months ago, but also like when you sell 700,000 copies of a game, like you don't have to right? keep yep. it like, cause also like everybody who bought this paid eight bucks for it. So yes. if the game's only a big deal for six months, like it was a great little experience. Right, you know, millions of dollars. Are right, you're there. not expecting yep. it to be an 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 an, uh, an endless service game at eight dollars. Right. You know, so yeah. yeah, good point. And and it's like uh, for a team and for the team, not expecting or or being accustomed to expecting small things because they're like, hey, we had small games that did okay. That's like tens of thousands of copies, right? If they did okay yeah. before, like that, and that's where your expectation level is set. So then to have something that's selling hundreds of thousands of copies, approaching a million in its first month uh, of copies sold, well, yeah, they're, they're going to be like, okay, this is more than enough. We can work with this amount of money, clearly. Um, and if they want to keep it going, if they, they think that's something that could benefit them, now they have the budget to do that, clearly. Um, yeah. All right, like I said, last couple of stories. Stellar Blade fans asked to go easy on its demo, which is almost twice as popular as Final Fantasy VII Rebirths. 
Once again, we've got Jordan Midler at VGC. Uh, Shift Up has asked players to go easy on the Stellar Blade demo, which is proving to be a hit with players. A demo for the PS5 exclusive launched last month ahead of the game's release on April 26th. We're so grateful for, you, for your love of our game. To enjoy the main game properly, though, please go easy on the demo, Stellar Blade said, as the Stellar Blade developer said. 50 plus hours of demo play were scared. <laughs> uh, according to market research firm Amp Ampere Anal Analysis, uh, the demo has been popular, attracting a peak of 690,000 90, daily active users. That's in comparison uh, to the demo for Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, which drew a peak of 380,000 daily active users. Um, yeah, so I, I, that is clearly people are ready for this game and they're excited. I yeah. thought that demo was really well put together and, and fun. Yeah, it's a good demo. Uh, it, it made me look, let's be clear, right? Prior to this demo dropping and people actually playing it, I was getting really tired of every conversation oh, yes. about this game having nothing to do with the gameplay. Absolutely. Um, you know, and like, yeah, it, it's, it's a, it's a pretty decent demo. Um, I'm sure the final game will be fun to play. I don't think it's like anywhere near peak when it comes to your character action games but like oh, it's no a good way. time it's a good time it's no Sekiro um, it's no it's it's no Devil May Cry 5 I think it's yeah it's it, you know it's not even near automata uh, automata near automata yeah uh, and, and um but I really like that boss fight I think everything yeah. else was kind of like a pretty mid for me to be frank it's I, it's it's definitely a lot of flash and yeah. and style and like production value and over like gameplay substance but I mean I, I, I'm gonna be real with you I could say the same thing about games like The Last of Us right like sure you know um and, and like that's, that's, that's I don't mean that as a fine, as yeah. a down like a put down like right. like that's where they focused their efforts and their money um and clearly if people are playing if, if the demo is that popular if people putting that kind of time into it then it's hitting with people um and that's only good for the game so i think that's great and again i like i think it's a it's a fun demo i think people should try that demo yeah. um I, you know, I, I, would, I and i also see why people are playing it a lot because um I, I did do the boss fight and then there's that boss like fight you could choose from the menu and I was like oh I would like to do this over and over again and get it like to, kind of flawless and looking yeah, as flashy yeah. as possible because that's that's where the game's at its at, at its strongest where it's like you are doing something pretty cool and it looks very cool uh and and yeah and those things coming together and being able to like master those systems enough that you can uh, get to that point that's what that's where all the fun is in that game yeah so I yeah get it. All right, uh, and the last thing here, just real quick, someone pointed out, uh, you've like only hours left to own Jim Ryan. Uh, Jim Ryan is available in the uh, PlayStation Stars program uh, as a bobblehead. You could own him, uh, but it's gonna go away soon. Apparently it's ending, I think later today or something like that. Mm. I have not done this yet. I don't know how to open PlayStation Stars. PlayStation Stars know. is the like NFTs that aren't NFTs, right? Like, yeah, I think yeah. That's <laughs> like right. I remember when they first announced it, we were all like, "Oh, these are this is NFT bullshit, isn't it?" And then it turned out like, no, it it basically is, but without any of the right. you know blockchain shit bullshit. attached to it. And I was yeah. like, oh, so it's just digital trading cards? Cool, uh -huh. like fine. Um, I guess like PlayStation Stars like has the option to like buy games with your points now. Someone pointed out like Bloodborne is in there and stuff like that. I'm like, oh. Okay, yeah. weird, okay. Uh, but, but that that's fine. But I'm like, I need that Jim Ryan bobblehead, please. I don't know where <laughs> I display it, how anyone ever sees it. Uh, I should I should go get the digital version so that I can, when I do 3D print my own uh, Jim Ryan bobblehead at the library, that I'm like, well, I own the digital version. This is just a physical backup, so you can't yeah. sue me. Yeah. All right, uh, I got a poll question. I'm going to get set up over here while I'm getting that going, though. Uh, Derek, why don't you tell people where they can find you, what you have going on, all that good yeah. stuff. Yeah, um, you can find me, um, unfortunately, still on Twitter um, at Derby City Derek. Um, I am on. I am the producer, editor, co-host of Super Deluxe Gamescast. Uh, so we are live on twitch.tv slash official SDGC every Thursday night at 9 p.m. for our live news show where we go over all of the week's latest like kind of news topics that we consider important. Uh, we do streams. We do reviews. We do stuff like that. Um, you can also find the show on Twitter at official SDGC. But, you know, following the show account is mostly just tweeting out like when we're going live uh, compared to following the cast members. But, um, yeah, you know, um, it's also it's primarily podcast first over streaming. So you can catch us live streaming. But in the end, everybody listens more than they watches. So. Uh, yep, I'm sorry. I guess someone was just put it in uh, in chat the link to a yeah. story about uh, Mihoyo verse being worth 
23 billion dollars which i think is more than epic games i choose not to think about it jeff i choose not to yeah, think about I, it you know what <laughs> god you're on to something there i'm just you know selling, what? Here's the, selling selling waifus is good currency um and i just don't <laughs> i don't i don't want to think time, about unfortunately. it <laughs> yeah. all right are you subscribed to ea play was our poll question from yesterday uh 12 said what is that 13% said yes, and 76% said no. And I wonder, like, how many in the yes category actually includes people who are like, well, technically I'm, I'm subscribed to EA Play because I have uh, Game Pass Ultimate. Yeah, that's that's how I would have answered that is yes, right. technically. So Yes, technically, right. But so I'm I, not I think paying some for EA did. Play separate. <laughs> right. That would be your, I know you're not a madman. Of course not. Yeah. <laughs> Um, That's not my flavor of mental illness. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm like, I would I would never subscribe to it. Well, I say I would never. I think I did very early on when they first announced it. But these days, the idea of like, oh, I don't need more games. That's uh, the last yeah. thing I need. You don't want to subscribe to Ubisoft Plus? No. Like... I, listen, I would subscribe to Ubisoft Plus for a month here and there to like play through Avatar when it launched or when yeah. to play Star Wars Outlaws. That's like a good deal as long as you remember to cancel. But yeah. Uh, yeah, otherwise, not so much. Um, all right, new poll question. Did you, buy, did you buy content warning? And your options are, I got it for free, I bought it, and I didn't buy it. Uh, so if you, even if you don't know what content warning is, you can just say, I didn't buy it. Uh, and we'll talk about the results of this poll on Monday here on Game Mess Mornings, uh, which I think I should be able to do. I'm, I'm remembering my wife is going to be out of town, but I think the kids are off on Monday, which actually makes it easier for me to do a show. So, yes, uh, Monday we'll talk about the results on Giant Bomb. Speaking of Giant Bomb, later today we will have UPF. Mike's going to play through my modded to hell version of Fallout 4. Look out for that. Uh, and then we'll have BCR, where we're going to talk about our most anticipated games left to be uh, left to come out this year. Uh, we kind of got through the bulk of what's been announced, and there's like some you know sprinklings out throughout the, throughout the rest of the year of a few games here and there. Uh, but we're gonna also going to give our like long shots for what we think could still come out. So that'll be on Bombcast Revengeance at 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, beyond that, though, we'll have more, plenty of more Giant Bomb next week. In the meantime, Derek, thank you so much for spending today talking with me about video games. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. This is a blast. Yeah, this was awesome. We'll definitely have, have you back on, make it happen oh, yeah. in the future. Oh, yeah. Anytime, anytime. And thank you all for watching. You're the best audience in gaming. Until next time, have a good one. Take care of yourself and goodbye and fade to black.